Good morning. It's 8.30 on Wednesday, July 24th. I'm Desiree Frazier. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, discussions continue over how Mississippi communities move forward with a flood mitigation plan in the Delta. Then a legislative task force is working with experts across many fields to better understand the mental health needs of youth in the state. Plus, how volunteers and organizers stood up to extreme violence in Mississippi as they pushed for voting rights in 1964's Freedom Summer Project. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. A team of federal officials are visiting with folks in the South Delta this week to better understand how several flood mitigation plans could affect their lives and the land around them. Flood risks have been high in the region since the 1940s, and officials have been seeking solutions for just as long. In 2019, the Yazoo backwater flood covered more than 500,000 acres, killing millions of crops. 686 homes were flooded along with three highways. The Army Corps of Engineers has proposed several solutions and must choose an option before December. The project with the most support is a system of pumps that could expel floodwaters out of the area, considered option number two by the Corps. Climate activists have criticized the plan for its possible disruptions to wildlife and how it could drain essential wetlands. But local residents say focusing on those downsides can ignore the toll flooding has had on the region for humans and wildlife. Here's Victoria Ulmer of Rolling Fork. I live in Ulmer. I've gotten up here for the last five years and told y'all my story and people in my community stories. It is, we appreciate all the work you put into this. But I would like to say that alternative one is not an option. Alternative four is not an option. Alternative two is the best of the four that you have given us. But those are not the best dates for us. We need a better planning date, cropping season, and elevation to the pump cuts on. It is not fair for us to have to be underwater for over six months. The amount that it took on our mental health in the area is unbelievable. I don't know if y'all are aware, but in Rolling Fork last year, we had an EF4 tornado that came through. Okay, that's a natural disaster. You cannot prepare for that. That just happens. This flood was a man-made disaster that deserves a man-made solution, and y'all can do that. This project was started in 1941 with the Flood Control Act. It stated it needed a pumping station. We are 83 years later, and we're still talking about it. I know y'all have worked very hard on this, but y'all can do better. You've got to. Our people and our community cannot keep going through this. The animals, you will not find more passionate, resilient people that care about the environment, the community, and the animals, and the people that live in this area. They want the best. They want this to be here for future generations. Because the truth of the matter is, it's not about us that live here now. It's about the future generation that is yet to come. They should not have to vote in and out of their houses just to survive or try to provide a living for their family. This should not be a struggle every time. It's ridiculous. Y'all know the problem is there. Let's fix this and do the best we can. We've got to. Because it's not about us here. It's about the future. Hey there. My name's Stormy Deer. I'm a licensed state wildlife rehabber. I live in Redwood, Mississippi. I don't have any scientific data that y'all would have, your scientists would have, but I will tell you that my husband and I's observation since the 2019 flood, the animal population is not back yet. The small animal, the mammals, we're just not seeing the numbers that we used to see. But let's talk about 1941. 83 years we've been here. We have 22 flood control levees in our geographical area. We are the only one. We make 23. We're the only one without a pumping station. Why is that? The last time that I spoke and what this is, because this is a dog and pony show, we flooded in 2019, five years, and we're still up here begging for people to do something, begging for environmental justice. I'm Martin Pace. I'm the sheriff of Warren County. 
I've been with the Warren County Sheriff's Office since 1981, and I've worked and experienced every flood since 81. I've been the sheriff since 1996. I've seen the devastation. The last time that we met, uh, when we were at the Vicksburg District, I quoted a lot of statistics. I had the hardcore stats of how many thousands and thousands of dollars of overtime, how it impacted the communities from a public safety standpoint. What I want to talk to you today about briefly is just the human impact and the wildlife impact. I'm the grandson of a game warden. Love wildlife. Don't hunt. Love wildlife. To ride that levee and see hundreds of deer and every other type of wildlife you can think of dead and dying on the side because of the flood water is devastating. To see baby deer, one of which still had the umbilical cord attached with a drowned mother in the backwater, there was literally no place to go. It looked like Noah's Ark. Everything that didn't swim was on that levee because it was the only place they could go. And this is not for days, it was for weeks on weeks, on weeks, on weeks, the ones that weren't drowning or starving to death. From a human impact, it not only adversely impacts the farmers, but it's everything downrange, all the domino effect, distribution chain down the line, it's affecting ability to provide income for their families. So it's not just that one farmer that's being affected. This is not just flooding buildings. This is affecting people's lives and it's affecting the wildlife in this area that are such a great part of us living in the state of Mississippi is enjoying the wildlife and enjoying the opportunity to be amongst the wildlife. That was a resident and a concerned Mississippian of the South Delta sharing thoughts about the Yazoo Backwater Pump Project, how emotional it is and how damaging it is, they say. And they also talk about other proposals to reduce flooding in the region, but not everyone is in favor of the pumps. Jill Mastro Totero with Audubon Delta says the project is nothing but agriculture-friendly drainage disguised as flood control. It's really disappointing that, uh, you know, we're at this stage of the game following what we felt like was a turning point of having EPA's veto restored by the current administration to really showcase the fact that this is an incredibly special and ecologically important place that would provide the roadmap for restoring what people need in terms of flood protection and providing that in the form of elevating homes and roads and, you know, giving farmers the opportunity, if they so desire, to replant their fields back to wetlands. And none of those elements were, are in the Corps' current plan. What this is, is the fact that there is no pretending anymore. This is first and foremost an agricultural drainage project that will, you know, be based around planting seasons. This would be one of the the largest hydro, hydraulic pumping station in the world. People will still be flooding, and that's a travesty. Um, there are massive impacts from this project, not just on the fact that there will be the most vulnerable in our community here in the South Delta continuing to flood with the pumps, but the fact that there are tremendous wetland impacts. In fact, it's buried in one of the Corps' appendices. You get to do the math to find out that there are at least 90,000 acres of wetland habitat that will be damaged by the pump operations. And that means damage to wildlife, migratory birds, fish, etc. And there is very little information in the thousand pages of paper that provides information about what those impacts actually look like to, you know, for my organization from a bird standpoint. Um, and so from a birds and people standpoint, we know this project to be, um, you know, something that is not going to provide the meaningful flood relief to the community um, and then it's going to have dramatic impacts to, you know, what we consider one of, a beautiful place. Um, and so we think that, you know, there is a better path forward. Um, and we know that to be a resilient strategy that our organizations have been hard at work putting together and presenting to the core, EPA, Fish and Wildlife Service, etc., cetera, um, that would provide the meaningful relief. That's Jill Mastro-Totero with Audubon Delta.
Coming up, a legislative task force is working with experts across professions to better understand the mental health needs of youth in the state. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. MPB Think Radio. Whatever your taste, news, music, storytelling, or how-to shows. Whatever your city, Natchez, Jackson, Tupelo, Cleveland. However you want. Radio, smart speaker, smartphone app. MPB Think Radio. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. State lawmakers are seeking answers on how to better meet the mental health needs of Mississippi's youth. A newly formed task force is meeting with experts across multiple fields of expertise throughout the summer to learn about unique challenges youth face today. That includes agencies like the Department of Mental Health, Child Protection Services, and Public Education. Dr. Lance Evans is Mississippi's new state superintendent of education. He says there's a national trend. Students are experiencing more mental health challenges these days than ever before. In my opinion, one of the most needed areas that we have, I think in the United States, but I'm speaking specifically to public education, because the issues that we find, uh, lots of times the students, they bring that with them from home. And we're charged with taking care of the student, no matter what. I always tell, I've always told our students, told the administrators that I work with, I'll be a student, I'll be your mom, your dad, your grandma, your granddad, whatever I got to be to make sure you're successful. And we have to make sure that we're providing the support for all of our students to make sure that we're creating pathways of success with no dead ends for them. Because we only have one shot. You know, we don't get to go back and redo their K-12 experience. But, you know, MDE is an agency. Uh, obviously, you all know this. We, uh, we're, we provide support services. We are a support organization for all of our school districts. We would not exist if it were not for the school districts in Mississippi. Provide professional development, technical assistance. Of course, we do have oversight of the academic piece as well as education, licensure, child nutrition, school finances, safe and orderly schools. MDE does employ one school-based professional counselor that provides support uh, and training from the department through to the counselors uh, in our schools. I'll tell you that currently um, school counselors are a very hot commodity, if you will. They're in very limited supply, I guess would be the best way to put it. Uh, And we need to find ways to bolster that number of people, but also maybe find more creative ways to create licensing opportunities for those uh, individuals. Because we have people, it does require a master's degree to be a, a licensed school counselor, so. Not, I absolutely do not want to diminish the expectations or anything like that. Please don't take me that way. But I, I think we have to be, this is 2024. So it's kind of one of those deals to where we've got to that point where we have to do things differently to make sure we're meeting the needs of all of our students. A lot of factors can play into the decline of youth mental health in recent years. Social media and connectivity can play a major role and make children feel inadequate. Evans says the pandemic continues to weigh heavy on many children as well. I will tell you, that shed a light on a lot of things. Obviously, that brought our country to its knees. And it also almost brought public public education to its knees. But thank goodness in Mississippi, we saw the importance of getting back in school quicker. Because I will tell you, that had a huge impact on the recovery of our students. Because I still see, I have two children. And uh, I had one that was old enough that, really wasn't that big of a deal, but I had a younger one and I could see the impact, you know, not being at school every day. You know, it's, it's different when they're not with their peers. The MDE has worked with the Mississippi Department of Mental Health to coordinate, to make sure that you're strengthening the, the access to mental health um, professionals in the schools. Because what happens in schools, in public schools, is you end up with most of those mental health professionals come from the outside in. School districts sign off that their employees have been trained every two years. Some do it more often. The last recommendation is to make sure and maintain fidelity in the training. Because we know all too often, it's kind of like a drill. If we don't take it serious, then we kind of do it, and then it kind of falls off the quality of it. And then what happens is, well, we forgot it this time, so we'll do it next time. But we have to stay very vigilant in making sure that the training pieces are taken care of, that we are doing the training like we're supposed to be doing every year. That concern about training mental health workers extends outside of K-12 schools. Kel Smith, 
Executive Director of Mississippi's Community College Board echoed that concern in his presentation to the task force. Part of the importance of the in-person counseling is these, these counselors can develop relationships with students. Uh, and oftentimes uh, that, that is critical to, to their success, both academically and, and outside the classroom. The college, some of the colleges offer telehealth counseling. Uh, some of the vendors they use are Timely Care, Mind Health, and Pingy, I think is how you say it. Obviously, telehealth counseling uh, allows for, for after hours opportunities, you know, mental health issues don't stop after 5 p.m. on Friday. Y'all know that. And so the, the, the telehealth counseling in today's world that we find ourselves ever connected uh, is, is critically important. Crisis intervention for, for urgent mental health care uh, concerns, that can be done after hours for students if they're experiencing, like I said, an incident or something for after traditional hours. They offer health and wellness fairs to educate students on, on mental health, uh, among other topics, trying to promote the overall well-being uh, of, of the students. Uh, they, they provide referral services. So if there's an issue that maybe the counselors aren't trained in, uh, they can refer them to, to professionals that can help address situations. Uh, Zen Dens is something that uh, a couple of colleges had mentioned. Uh, these are, are meditation spaces, uh, uh, relaxation space provided to address stress, anxiety, and feeling over the sense of overwhelmingness. You know, what does the student of tomorrow look like and what is what are his or her needs? And what I mean by that is who, who would have thought, you know, five years ago that, that our students would have been impacted uh, as they have by COVID. You know, they were isolated and socially distanced and their routines were completely shaken up and turned upside down. And so, uh, you know, we just may not know what, what tomorrow looks like. Uh, you know, some of the challenges the students face today, academic pressure, social media, financial stress, uncertainty about the future. And so what can we do to help address that? That's Kel Smith, Executive Director of the Mississippi Community College Board. Coming up, how volunteers and organizers stood up to extreme violence in Mississippi as they pushed for voting rights in 1964's Freedom Summer Project. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Wednesdays on MPB Think Radio help solve your problems. Fix It 101 takes your DIY questions and listens to your proud accomplishments at 9 a.m. Everyday Tech explains tech news and solves your gadget problems at 10 a.m. The original Southern Remedy covers all types of medical issues that affect your life at 11 a.m. Our phone lines open up after Mississippi Edition. Continue to listen on MPB Think Radio. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. This is the 60th anniversary of Freedom Summer. Freedom Summer was a time where hundreds of volunteers from across the nation came to Mississippi to help register voters and educate them about their rights, specifically black voters. Those volunteers and the locals who helped organize it were met with extreme violence. Three men were murdered early in the summer of 1964 by white supremacists in Philadelphia, Mississippi, who had colluded with the local sheriff's department. Among those victims were two white males, Andy Goodman and Michael Scherner of New York, and James Cheney, an African-American from Meridian, Mississippi. The violence didn't stop there. And that's the topic of this week's History is Lunch today at noon at the two Mississippi museums in Jackson. Bruce Watson is author of the book, Freedom Summer, The Savage Season, that made Mississippi burn and made America a democracy. He's speaking on the subject, as I mentioned, at today's History is Lunch. If it were just the three murders of Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney, which are always what everyone focuses on, on these anniversaries and other things, that would have ended, that, that would have been savage enough. But as I began to research it, I was astonished to see, because uh, the people involved in Freedom Summer, the volunteers kept a, a very accurate, almost a police record of the violence, uh, how much violence there was. Uh, no one else was killed, but as people thought there would be. But almost every day brought a, a beating, a volunteer beaten. A uh, guy was hit with a bicycle chain. There, were, there was another man beaten up with a tire iron. Uh, the, it was really... Um, 
a relentless campaign of violence to drive volunteers out, and it didn't work. That's the big message of Freedom Summer. The volunteers stayed on and uh, and kept up with their task. Just to be clear, it was James Cheney. Uh, he was black from Meridian, Andrew Goodman and Michael Schorner, who were from New York City, and they were with the Council of Federated Organization, COFO. They volunteered for Freedom Summer to register blacks to vote and also to work with Freedom Schools, correct? Well, it was a little different because Schwerner had, Michael Schwerner had, who everyone called Mickey, had been down in Mississippi, had been in Meridian since uh, the first of the year, the first of 1964. He came with his wife, Rita. They came, um, I, believe, I believe, under COFO uh, to basically set up a Freedom House before anyone even knew there would be a Freedom Summer. So they had been here, and that's part of the problem. That was part of the problem, and one of the reasons they were killed because they had been spotted by the Klan right away and put on a hit list. And then when they went up, when uh, they went up with Cheney, who became a good friend of Schwerner in uh, Meridian, when they went up to the Ohio training for Freedom Summer, they met Andrew Goodman, who was a volunteer coming south to work, and they convinced him to come down with them before the training was done and go investigate a church burning. And so the three of them were together in that. Uh, in, in out in um, in um, Neshoba County when when they were killed. When you were studying this, what was the appetite for such violence? Violence of Freedom Summer can't be understood without the overall context of Mississippi and, to a certain extent, the rest of the South, but especially Mississippi and the Deep South. And that was a context that dated back to the Civil War. Uh, the uh, Mississippi had been the most torn up, uh, leveled, destru- destroyed state with the highest per capita casualties in the Civil War. And um, that war was still in many ways going on. Uh, the resentment of both the war and the reconstruction that followed uh, as a northern invasion uh, triggered all sorts of enraged people in Mississippi. And this was seen as really another invasion from the north coming down to tell a quote unquote how us how to treat our colored that's their words and um and it had to be according to the to the white supremacists especially the Klan and others had to be resisted with full force was there a sense of a love for the country or was it a love for the life of the south during jim crow in many ways, a lot of people back in Mississippi 1964 wouldn't have seen a separation between that. They, they thought the South was the country, and uh, and it was. But uh, I, I think it was more of a Southern versus Northern thing. It was a revival of that feeling that, that the South had been had suffered. Uh, during the Civil War, there had been a whole rewriting of history to, uh, to make it uh, appear as if Reconstruction was a horrible time when there was all sorts of rape and pillage and uh, black voting that was taking over and corruption, et cetera. It was all wrong. It was, it's all been since corrected, except in the minds of some people. And uh, it's been, but that was widely believed, not just in the South. And uh, that rewriting of, of Reconstruction and post-Civil War history, and that was all very much alive throughout Mississippi and throughout the South. And so this was this was a hundred years that almost when almost nothing in terms of people's attitudes had changed. Bruce Watson is author of the book Freedom Summer, the savage season that made Mississippi burn and made America a democracy. He's speaking today on this subject at History is Lunch at the Mississippi Two Museums. We'll continue our conversation with him tomorrow. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. 